Okay, here's a much better title than the one I originally gave. How about this? How to avoid epistemic dumbness. <laughs> so, so, a friend of mine said that the other day. I thought, oh, that sounds really fun. That's a much better way to say it. Um, uh, so, let me introduce myself a little bit because you guys don't really know me. Very well. Um, Chris Ganston. Uh, and I kind of have a, a dual, a double life uh, here at, at Mizzou. So, on the one hand, I teach as an adjunct in the philosophy department. I did my PhD here at Mizzou. But on the other hand, I also work with CREW, which is a campus ministry on Cam you may have heard of. Some of you might have heard of them. So, uh, so I kind of am bivocational, I guess you could say. Um, and I'll just tell you just a little bit about me. So, um, other, I'm married, I got four kids. Um, but I was, uh, I have not always been a Christian. I, I, I'm a Christian, if you didn't figure that out. So it's, it is a requirement to work for a crew, I think. Um, so, uh, but when I was a junior in college, it was really the first time. I mean, I grew up, my parents were hippies, you know, we had the Volkswagen van with the curtains in it and everything, so, um, you know, that was that was kind of my life growing up. You know, my dad, at his funeral, we played Pink Floyd, Beach Boys, and, uh, you know, let's see, who else, uh, you know, some other music, you know, I mean, you can get the idea of what, you know, what my family was into, so, um, but then in college, really, I had a friend who was a religious person, we started getting into debates, and he was the first person that wasn't afraid to talk to me. Um, so we had a lot of conversations that went really well, and to make a long story short, you know, I, I thought, I finally heard, like, the message in a clear way, I thought, oh, wow, okay, maybe this is what I've been looking for, and jumped in, and uh, it's kind of been, I've been the road ever since, and what led me to do a PhD in philosophy was just because I became a Christian, I didn't stop having questions. I didn't stop wondering about life, the universe, and everything. I, you know, I read all of the Duncan Adams books as a kid, you know. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to go as deep as the rabbit hole would let me go. So I can't, I, I don't think I'm going to get another PhD. I think that's pretty much as far as I'm going. Um, but yeah, I just love, I'm a truth seeker. Um, I want to know more, I want to understand things. So that's, that's kind of why I'm here. So, and my dissertation was about this idea of not epistemic naughtiness. I, I wasn't bold enough to put that in my dissertation title, but, but it's this idea of, of believing responsibly or believing well. Um, sometimes people call this, um, in a simpler ways, the ethics of belief, right? So we want to believe things that are true, but you don't want to just get the truth, because you could do that by accident, right? You want to believe, and you want to know why you believe it, and have good reasons, and to be supported by evidence and logic and that sort of thing. So you don't want to just believe things and get lucky that it's true, um, to believe well, and, and a lot of people think if you believe, even if you get it right, but you have no good reasons for believing it, and you've gone about it in a haphazard way, then that there might even be something ethically wrong with doing that. Right? It might, you might be sort of in ethical trouble. You, you've been epistemically naughty. So epistemic has to do with knowledge, right? So it's just what philosophers like. It's a word they like to use. So, um, so that's a little bit about me and my story. Uh, but I think we all care about believing well. And I think, actually, you guys, probably more than most people on campus, you care about believing well, right? About thinking carefully. Um, when I used to work, before I came to Mizzou, I worked at Kansas State University. And there was a group there called the Individuals for Free Thought. They were kind of like your counterparts at K-State. And they had, a, they had a list. This was a long time before sophisticated internet and stuff, and, this, and we had email, that was like our main vehicle for communication. And they had a list serve, you know, if you've ever heard of one of those. So you send your email to the thing and it sends it out to everybody, right? So we have all these conversations and debates on this list serve, you know. Um, and I remember one time I was, I was talking to some people in that group, 
And they said, oh, does crew have a group like, have a, a listserv like this too, where you guys debate stuff and talk about it? And I was like, no, we don't. And I was kind of ashamed. You know, I thought, we should. But the truth is, um, it is true. You know, I, I have to admit that religious people um, tend to fall into epistemic naughtiness more often than, than maybe the average person, I don't know. Um, without thinking carefully about their beliefs or even questioning things and really getting deeper and going for the answers. So, so I've, you know, I've not only wanted to make that not true about me, but I've, I want to help other people you know, avoid that same, that same error. But it happens to all of us, right? Can we just be honest, right? I mean, we can all be epistemically naughty from time to time. Um, uh, and so what I want to do today, is I, or tonight, is I'm going to give you kind of a model for belief, and then a couple of ideas that can help you avoid um, epistemic naughtiness. All right? So let me give you the model first. It's kind of a visual, I'm a visual person. So here's a rough, a rough model. And this is, feel free, I mean, we get to the Q&A, feel free to, you know, push me, push back on this stuff, okay? Because this is not like from the Bible, okay? This didn't come out of heaven, right? So let's say, I'm just going to use a black box thing here, right? This is, I'm going to call this a, a belief forming mechanism or BFM, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so a belief forming mechanism, it's something in your brain, right? I, we don't know how it works yet, cognitive scientists are still working on this, we don't know exactly how it works, but you get inputs, right? And you get outputs, and this is just basic cognitive science, okay? You get inputs and you get outputs, and something happens in here in the black box in your head that puts stuff together and makes beliefs, right? So the outputs are beliefs. That's, that's what we're interested in tonight, right? So, so the inputs, there's all kinds of inputs that can go in to your BFM and, uh, <laughs> and can get put together in various ways to make beliefs. Okay? And beliefs, by the way, I'm using the word belief in a totally generic way. It's not like religious belief. It's your belief that I'm standing in this room talking to you right now. It's the belief that you're sitting in a chair. It's a belief that you, know, you haven't had dinner yet and you're hungry. It's a belief that you live in a house at a certain address. Right? You have millions of beliefs. And they get put together. and all, Some of them snuck in when you weren't looking. Um, some of them happen just you know, when you're not even paying attention. Some of them you really thought through and you worked on them for a long time, right? But you've got millions of these. So let me just ask you, and I'm just, this is going to be interactive, right, kind of thing. So lots of inputs. What kinds of things do you think would count or what would be inputs that would go into your mind and be the things that would make the ingredients for beliefs, right? Give me some ideas of what kinds of things you think would count as inputs. Maybe like patterns? Is that what you're kind of asking? It could be all kinds of stuff. So there's, there, there could be some wrong answers, but what do you mean by patterns? Like any time you do X, Y happens, you might then believe that X causes Y. Okay. Um, I'm going to call that. So we're just going. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to look at lots of these. Okay. So um, patterns. Here, let's do it this way. So that's an interesting way to put it. So patterns, what that sounds like to me is, that sounds like a certain kind of reasoning, right? So like causal reasoning or something like that, right? So where you take two things and you go, hmm, if I put these two things together, I get this, right? Or something like that, okay? What other kinds of things are inputs do you think that, yeah? Um, anything tangible sensory. Okay. Senses, so like your five senses. Yeah. Right, so you see stuff, right? So like, um, when you walked into the, or, yeah. Five plus. Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, and are you thinking about, like, proprioception? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, 
that's sort of your awareness of your your own of your own body, right? But we might call that introspection. You know, we could call it introspection. It's how you know that you're hungry or you're in pain, things like that. Sort. Okay. What are you, a philosophy major or something? Okay. <laughs> Would yeah. you say like educational background? Okay. Your background your values. Your background. So what kinds of things would fall under background? Just think of everybody, not just for you, but anybody. Experiences. Okay, I'm going to give that a whole different category, right? Because I think that one's really important. Even though, um, because you're having those all the time, it's constantly updating, right? But, but when I think of background, I'm thinking like... Workplace. What's that? Workplace. Yeah, like, and what, what do you get from sort of your family of origin? Your political orientation, your race, your gender, your teacher. Okay, well, okay, so, um, um, on socioeconomic, uh, political, you know, back background. Your genetic makeup. Your your genes. Well, your genes would be part of this probably. Right, your genes would be part of the mechanism that processes inputs. Your genes aren't inputs. Like I don't give you genes. You know, you can if you want to start at like zero. What is where zero is? Let's just say is at your birth. You know, or whenever you started forming beliefs. There's something that's objectively there, but I know what you're saying. You're saying that your genes, you know, once they're expressed or whatever, they influence your perception of reality going forward. But there is something that's inherently there, or else you wouldn't exist. That's right. Absolutely. But it's sort of the hard wiring, mm -hmm. right? And, it, and then you get inputs, and, and they are affected by the hard wiring, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. So, so experiences, background, how about, I mean... Human interaction. Okay, well, I'm going to... Human interaction. I'm going to put that under experiences. What kind of human interaction are you thinking of? I mean, literally anything. Right, talking to people, right? So you might have... So you get a lot of stuff as a kid that kind of comes in before you're even thinking about it, right? So maybe religious beliefs, your, you know, things you get from your family. Um, these are sort of stuff that kind of gets preloaded. It's kind of like when you get a computer and it's already got Windows on it, right? Um, you know, you, you didn't really get to choose that. I mean, much, I mean, that's for like non-computer savvy people like me, you know. Um, they just, they're there, and then it's like, okay, what do I do with it? Right, so you have some stuff like that that's, that just happens to be there sometimes, and then later you process it, you look at it, you examine it, right? But that is a sort of an input early on, so stuff you get early on. What else? Anything else pop in your head? I was thinking, like, wouldn't, I think education would fall kind of outside of that, um, just because, you know, the idea that, I mean, every... Like, because as you're growing up, as you get an education, like, most of your beliefs are going to come from based on what you learned in school and based on your upbringing. Okay. I think it's like slightly different because it's not something that's just there at birth. Um, it's just yeah. something, it's something that you're kind of growing with right. really throughout life. Yeah. Sure, I'll give it a category. It's not crucial that they categories line up in exactly a certain way. We just want to get an idea for the different sorts of things that are out here. Anything else out there that you would say would be important things that maybe you rely on in forming your beliefs? Anything else? Like stuff you think is really helpful. Facts and evidence. Well, yeah. all these can count as evidence of one kind or another. What? Sorry. Like empirical evidence? So, okay. like if you're trying to form a belief about, I don't know, anything. So, if you look okay. at like numbers, like studies that were done and things like that. Can I just call that science? Sure. Empirical yeah. research and evidence of one of various kinds, right? I mean, you could, the stuff you get through your five senses is empirical evidence, mm -hmm. right? I believe that you're sitting there because I see it with my eyes. It's empirical. Um, yeah, I would say that certain thoughts or lack of thoughts that may be distinct from beliefs. For example, how I know that a square circle is impossible seems to be from me being unable to conceive of it. So thoughts or lack of thoughts. Okay, so that, I mean I count that under logic. So it's sort of the reason is sort of the. Um, It's not only an input, but it's it's a way that we process inputs. So 
it's kind of, it could almost kind of fall in here, but it's kind of, you know, but it's, it's also, you can create new beliefs with logic, right? So, for instance, like if I said, if I said, um, I have four kids, I hate three of them, you know instantly I love one of my kids, or I don't hate one of my kids, right? You got that from reason. You picked that belief up strictly from logic. That's a stupid example. I don't hate my kids. <laughs> but, um, um, right, so you can, reason can give you new beliefs. Um, okay, I think there's one other that's not up here that I think is actually, yeah. What about feelings? Yeah. Well, I mean, tell me what you mean by feelings. Um, maybe intuition. Something yeah. that you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Emotions. Your gut, right? You just get gut feelings about things sometimes. And sometimes it's right, right? I think we, we, have, we actually have some of these mechanisms. They've been developed over millions of years to actually help us in some ways. And some of them work really well. Some of them work, eh, eh, you know. But generally, they can be helpful. Um, but I think we've covered most of the kinds of stuff that goes in, right? But the thing, the thing I want you to realize is that there's a lot of different kinds of stuff going in. And as much as often we want to think that all of my beliefs come from reason and logic, right? Mm -hmm. That's not really true, right? You know, or all of my beliefs come from science. Or all of my beliefs, you know, I just, you know, or for like a Christian might say, oh, I just believe the Bible and that's it, right? You, well, not really. You know, who taught you how to read, you know? So, um, so you have beliefs from a lot of different sources. And um, uh, let me finish the model, and I'm coming back to that. Okay, now, well, I did, that is the finish. That is sort of the finishing of the model. But I'll add one thing. So there's another kind of input that comes into the that comes into play here that that affects or it gets into our belief forming mechanism, and it can kind of change things a little bit. And that's going to be. What you were talking about, what's your name with the Aaron? Aaron? This is this is where I'd say emotions, your desires, they can kind of come in and start fiddling with things. So here's how one of the two categories we got. These are the what I call all of these are what we call sort of cognitive inputs, right? And these would be your non-cognitive inputs. Oops. Right, so you have cognitive inputs and you have non-cognitive inputs. Yeah. One question I have about the model overall. So it's would, perfect. Would, Come would, on. would religion be under outputs more than inputs? Because coming to like oh. a choice about religion would kind of it seems like a lot of the other factors would lead to that being a belief. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it could be under both. Is that well, so like you're that you're four years old. Yeah. You're four years old. Yeah, I guess you're kind of you to church. You know, no, I had the animals on the on the ark. Do you yeah. believe that? Good. Here's a cookie. You know, so okay. right. <laughs> So you just got a new belief, right? Where did it come from, right? So it's, it came from a, a human interaction experience. It came from five senses, right? But, but some of that is just, I think it's just important for everyone to recognize sometimes religion plays a special role in coming in and giving you new beliefs, right? It can come in in a special way that is different from other things. So I just want to make sure... It's just good to be aware of all this stuff. And then, sure, the outputs are believed. Sometimes inputs, beliefs can be inputs and outputs, right? But you're right, the outputs are going to be, um, you're going to have outputs that are beliefs about science, or beliefs about religion, or beliefs about other people, beliefs about the reliability of your eyesight and things like that, right? Okay. Ooh, where yeah. Would, where would you put God? That depends on your theology, right? So, um, some people think that there's a there's a, a sixth sense, right? Aside from maybe a seventh in your case, right? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. But some people think there's a, a special faculty you have in addition to your five senses that allows you to perceive God, right? And that's the source of your beliefs about God. For your true, your true beliefs about God, um, I just wasn't going to get into that. I mean, maybe that's the case, maybe not. I don't know. Right? It's an interesting model, but say so you put God on the input side. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah. cognitive. Well, if it's 
propositional, right? If there's stuff coming in where God speaks, say God speaks to you and says, I'm here and I'm wonderful. Don't your emotions do the same thing? Your emotions do not, do not give you propositional content, right? Your emotions can do things like you could hear a proposition and be fearful, right? Or you could hear a proposition and feel really wonderful about it. That would make you more inclined to believe it, perhaps. But it's non-cognitive in the sense that there's no propositional content. There's no, um, and just like desires. My desire for a cheeseburger is not, a, like, I want a cheeseburger is, it's just a, it's just a bare thing. It's like that Selena Gomez song, right? My heart wants what it wants. You know, it's, it's just, right? So it's, they're not, they're not really about thinking and reasoning. It's just, blah, it's just feelings and stuff, right? Um, and that's part of being human. That's fine. These aren't bad. Right? These are these can be really good, right? Um, right, okay, so so far so good. It's not perfect, right? But it, it's just a sketch. It's a rough sketch. Okay? Um, okay, so so now here's the thing. So two ideas that can help us avoid epistemic naughtiness. Because what we want, what we all want is we want, right, this is what we want, I think. True beliefs about what matters most. Well, that's, that's actually, let's call, let's go a little step further. Let's say, in this case, what we want is we want um, responsible, uh, responsible true beliefs about the things that really matter, right? Um, it's not enough just to have a bunch of trivia. But you want to have true beliefs, responsibly formed true beliefs, that's what adults want, um, about things that really matter. Right? I mean, I think that's what we all want. We care about this stuff. Um, that's why, you know, you, you scoff when you go through the checkout line and there's like the National Enquirer or whatever, and you're just like, oh. you know, you get really annoyed. Or you see TV shows or whatever that are saying things you think are being, are irresponsible, right, in terms of what they're telling people or supporting makes you mad because you care about this stuff. Um, okay, so so two things, two things. The first thing is, number one, think committee, not dictatorship. Okay? You have, you have all these things. You could think of them, you could kind of group them into like, five categories, but you could think of them as like seats on a committee. And they all get to be involved in the process of belief, belief formation, right? They don't really have much of a say. You, you could mess with this a little bit, but for the most part, your inputs, the various kinds of inputs, are all, they all have a seat at the table. And we shouldn't necessarily only say we're only going to listen to one of them or we're going to discount or dis or discard altogether one of these uh, committee members because they can all give us really valuable stuff right they can all produce they can all provide good information or good inputs from time to time not every time right it's like think of it like uh, checks and balances right if one category is getting out of hand and maybe, to, you know, starting to push a little too hard, going the wrong way, the other categories can come in and help, right? So when you think about all these, they can all be good because not only do they form beliefs initially, but they're involved in the process of processing your beliefs. So like right now, I think it was, um, was it Descartes? He said you can think of your beliefs as this big barrel of apples, right? And you want to make sure you've got good apples. So you kind of go through them one at a time. You look at your beliefs and you go, it's got worms in it, has it got you know fungus on it or whatever? Throw it out. Right? Let's just keep the good ones. So you're all of these things can help you in that process. Right? All of these things can help you in the process. So you don't want to have a dictatorship. You don't want to have one category doing all the work. Right? And that's what happens, sadly, right? So your favorite whipping boy, you know, religious people. So that's what happens for religious people sometimes, right? You get a dictatorship going. But it can happen to anybody, right? They're not the only ones. Everybody is, is prone to epistemic naughtiness, right? So think committee, not dictatorship. The other thing you want to think of is, um, how does I get to this? 
The other thing you want to think about is, um, I'll put it this way, be aware of biases, right? And that's, I want to say that's where this is, this is coming in. Now your emotions and desires, you know, you could be like Spock, and you could just say, I'm just going to get rid of that altogether because it's just gumming up the works. Um, but I think, you know, we're humans, and we're not designed to work that way, right? If that was a better way to go, maybe evolution would have done that, but it didn't. So our emotions and desires can actually play a helpful role. It's just a matter of keeping them in their appropriate role, right? Or, or keeping them under control, I guess, you know, I know that sounds kind of stoic. But, um, and so you have to be aware of your biases. You, none of us are unbiased. We're all biased. So let me just give an example. Um, so, you know, years and years ago, when they were first um, trying to figure out what, um, what was in a human egg, right? So they had these really primitive microscopes, and they were looking at the egg, and it was kind of fuzzy. It was, and you had these people, and they had a certain view. They were already committed to a certain view. And that view was that there was a fully formed but itty-bitty person inside the egg, right, the ovum. And they were already committed, that was their view, right? That was their, their scientific view. And so when these, these early microscopes came around and they saw this fuzzy thing, they're like, it's, it's a, it is a person, oh my gosh! It looks just like a tiny little itty bitty tiny person, I can see it, you see it? I see it, right? That's what some people, you would call confirmation bias, right? So, we all do that sometimes, it's very easy. There are some things we want to be true. Let's just be honest, right? There are some things you want to be true, and there's some things you don't want to be true, right? If you're if you're just flat out honest, you know, I'm pretty com I'm pretty committed to my my religious beliefs at this point. I I honestly can say I don't want them to be false, right? I don't, I'll be really bummed <laughs> if it turns out to be false, right? I've got a lot of invested there. But because I know that's the case, I know I have to be extra careful, right? Because I'm, I'm going to be very prone to confirmation bias and other kinds of biases within that sense. So I, I have to take extra steps, sometimes do extra research, do extra reading, look at my beliefs a second, a third time, and be very careful, right? To talk to other people, say, am I, am I doing this? Am I being biased? What do you think? That helps, right? So you have to know your biases. Sometimes you have to correct for them. Because your emotions and desires can kind of come in and gum up the works. They can be helpful in some cases, right? They help you. Sometimes you have irrational, irrational obstacles against believing what's true. And your emotions and desires can sometimes come in and give you a little extra push to actually get you closer to the truth. Um, so, so just keeping an eye on those kinds of things. So that's, that's the model. Um, it's one way to think about how beliefs are not only formed initially, but then how you go about continuing to process them, right? Because beliefs can come up to the table, right? They can get called up at any time, and you go, now, you know, I read that years ago. Now, what do I think of that now? Right? And it's good to, to examine those things, right? So, and all these things can help you. Right? Sometimes ethics is tough, you know, like when I teach ethics, sometimes there are things like cannibalism. Most people think cannibalism is wrong, but if, if I said, give me an argument that, to explain exactly why it's wrong, it's really hard. It's really hard, right? But you know, you just, <clears throat> it's like, it just, it's just wrong. You know, your gut, now, is that like a great argument? No, it's not an argument, but your gut can sometimes help you get to the right answer, right? And you shouldn't always ignore it. Okay, so that's the model. Um, think committee, not dictatorship. Let all the things come into play, right? Don't exclude one in principle. Um, you might appoint a chairman. You might say one of them is going to kind of be, you know, give leadership to the others or something, but, um, or chairperson. Uh, but, uh, but you don't want a dictatorship. So, and then be aware of your biases. Okay, so that's a way to avoid epistemic naughtiness. So, and then on one last thing, um, roughly, I would say this, and anybody can be prone to this, just, you know, I know it's, 
when I, okay, when I was an atheist, all right, when I was in college, my first couple of years, even in high school, and I considered myself an atheist, um, I prided myself on this idea that I thought I was being more reasonable right, than everybody else. I thought I was being smarter. Um, now, that may be true of all of you, that maybe you actually are far more reasonable than everyone else, and maybe you're far more intelligent there. But it turned out it wasn't really the case for me. Um, I was not, I was being, I was probably epistemically naughty, you know. Um, because a lot of us, some, we tend to think we're doing better than we really are. And that's just human nature, right? Human beings grossly overestimate their ability to be reasonable and to come up with true conclusions. I mean, everybody thinks they're above average in reason, right? Um, if you take a poll, you know, most people think they're above average. Um, so people are really bad. We're horrible at probabilities. We're horrible. I mean, but the equipment we have, this wasn't designed to do that stuff perfectly. We're not computers, right? The equipment we have is basically designed to like make sure we get food and sex and stuff like that. So basically, right? So so it's not great at like intense probability calculation and you know decision theory. So so humility is a great um, a great attitude to have. Always think you, you could be wrong about stuff. So so that's my take on how to avoid epistemic naughtiness. So now I didn't really say much about religion. I'm hoping maybe people ask questions about that. But um, but yeah, questions about any of the stuff, push back, like if you think maybe some of it's not quite right to work in progress. So oh. Seven o'clock. So if nobody has to leave, you're good to go. But if not, please stay. Yeah, it won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah. Any, any. I don't know. Yeah. Comments or. Yeah. Um. One. One of the things that's always kept me from religion is the concept of faith. Yeah. Um, I thought that would come up. Yeah. So, um, how how do you reconcile that with believing responsibly? I don't even know what faith is. To be quite honest, I know anybody watching this, if you know who I am, you're going to be appalled, right? So, but just to be honest, there are so many theories about what faith is. Um, you know, Mark Twain said, faith is believing stuff you know ain't true. Now, I don't think that's right. Um, but there are lots of other ways to think about faith, and I have not figured out what it is. So, when I think about God, I just think of it like this, right? There were, there were lots of inputs. There was a belief forming mechanism, maybe there was some of this, and then I got I got my belief, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff happens automatically, without, I mean, you, you can't help it, right? If I turn off the lights, you're all going to believe that it's dark, right? And if I said, I'll give you a million dollars to believe there's a pink elephant on this table, I'll give you a million, I'll give you ten billion dollars, you can't do it, because you can't, I don't think you have that kind of control of your belief. So... So when I think about even religious beliefs, I think this is basically how it happens. There's different kinds of inputs, and they kind of get in here, and they get mixed around, and you shake, and boom. And it's just, it's kind of hard to explain. I mean, maybe there's like a, a God thing in there that happens. Maybe there's some kind of special input. So I, I kind of feel the same way about, like, my belief that there is not a God or my belief that there's not empirical sure. evidence to support one. Sure. Um, do you would you say that it's possible that like uh, in the in the same way that you couldn't not believe that there is one, I couldn't believe that there is one? Well couldn't is an interesting word. So to say can't believe, right? Right. That's a that's a strong word. Maybe disingenuous. Um, like it would be disingenuous for me to believe that there is a God, or disingenuous for you to believe that there is a God. I think I think what you're right about is like if I said, I want you to believe right now, yeah. and I'll give you ten million dollars, or I'll put a gun to your head. If you don't believe in God right now, I'm gonna blow your brains out, right? I don't think you could do that. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but over time, over the next ten years, who knows, right? Yeah, so, as your inputs change, your outputs yeah, yeah, yeah. change. So who knows over ten years? Now Personally, from what I've, I know, I've read quite a bit of cognitive science on this, and there, there are theories out there that suggest that it is actually more difficult for some people than others. 
due to just the way your brain is wired, right? So, so it may be, it's just harder for some people than others, you know? Um, but some, the evidence does support that the vast majority of people, that, that there's something hardwired into the average brain that sort of um, fosters belief in God. It's sort of hardwired by evolution or whatever you want to say. I saw it. And that's just kind of, and it just happens to most people. I have seen um, a lot of different, actually we had somebody talk about that when, uh, oh, I wish Mark was here, actually. What was um, the talk that that guy did about like transcending the self? You oh, talked about the uh, yeah. Dr. Cohen. The yeah. yeah, how, yeah. how, how we're, we're, we, we, are, we are hardwired to like make conclusions because that helps us evolutionarily. Yeah. Um, and that he talked about that as being a lot of where the belief in God comes from. Yeah. Is is you you want something to be true. Like like you you want there to be a reason for something. So you, right. even if you create one, you just have a desire to create yeah. meaning. These come into play. Yeah. And that happens, right? Um there are there are a lot of people who believe in God and if you really, and, and it's, now let's take, talk about adults, right? Not children, but adults. And I'd say there are a lot of people walking around this campus who believe in God and they're doing it irresponsibly. Right? Yeah. Um, now it's hard to know, it's hard, I, I'm not going around like checking and like <laughs> passing judgment on people. I, I don't think I could really figure out through a series of interviews whether someone's doing it irresponsibly or not. It's really hard to tell. But I bet it happens a lot, and there are probably a lot of you who hold your views irresponsible. I'm not a lot of you, probably less than average in this room. But um, I'm giving you a, a benefit of the doubt there. But there are probably lots of people who who aren't religious who might be irresponsible in the way they're believing, right? Um, some people are trying really hard, and they're still, you know, making mistakes. But it's it's possible to be, almost to believe stuff and do it well or do it poorly. Whether you got the truth or not, right? So you, I mean, do you think you could believe truly but badly? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you could. And could you believe falsely but believe really well? We had we had a talk uh, a week ago on cognitive dissonance. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Cognitive dissonance can be helpful at times, you know. Um, if you ignore it. When it comes to your beliefs about important things, I think that's part of being irresponsible, right? Um, now, epistemic irresponsibility is not like, it's not something that I would, you know, I don't think we should throw people in jail for it or, you know, public shaming or anything, but it's something you want to avoid, you know, it's like, in general, if you are a truth seeker, if you're being epistemically responsible, you're more likely to get to the truth. But yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. I just kind of went sure. off. Uh, and I, I have one more question. Yeah, uh, it's about the model itself. Yeah. So I, I would say, and I don't want to speak for everybody, certainly, but I would say that most people in this room probably put the vast majority of their emphasis on the reasoning, the logic, and the, mm -hmm. the science sessions. Um, but your argument is not that you should just rely on that alone. It's yeah. that all of this is important. So why, why is it that all of that is as important when determining what is a good belief, yeah, rather than just what is empirically true or what can be reasoned to be true. Well, because I mean, it, your senses can deceive you for one thing, right? You all know that if you ever looked at those optical illusions and stuff like that. Your senses are not one hundred percent reliable, right? And if our senses are not reliable, um, not only are your senses not one hundred percent reliable, but your interpretation of the data is not one hundred percent reliable. Right? And this is any science majors, people in the hard sciences, right? I mean, this is a huge problem in science, right? I mean, you get data, but then you have to interpret the data. And th that's not easy. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? Data does not mean anything. You have to, you sort of have to, there's patterns that we have that help us interpret and give meaning to it. Now, you can have good interpretations and bad interpretations of data, right? But that's the reasoning process. Sometimes scientists go with their intuitions, right? There are some times when you just, you just have a feeling about something. 
right? And that can actually help you sometimes, right? So you don't want to totally ignore that stuff. Um, you have experiences. You can have all kinds of experiences. It's not just having a conversation with somebody. You can have, I don't know, um, it, it's one thing to see a white image on, on a board. If I see the board is white. But I'm also having a, a particular experience of whiteness, right? So there's more than merely the image. There's more than just a seeing. There's an experience of it. And that, there's interpretation involved in that, too. So, I mean, the truth is, if you really get down to it, you cannot do without. You can't just cut one of these out and rely on all the others only, right? And this, you know, something a word I didn't use up here. This is a word that I think a lot of you are probably very averse to, right? But it's this idea of authority. But the truth is, you rely on it every day, right? You rely on the scientists and the great scholars and thinkers who've gone before you and have, and have thought of brought a lot of really awesome stuff. And a lot of them you trust. You take their word for it and you stand on their shoulders, right? And that's how we get to the next level of discovery. Yeah. But as a body of science, that's reproducible. It is. But have you reproduced all of it? Uh, you can step by step, not in one line. In principle, yes, course. but you don't. You take it on authority a lot of times, right? But you could. Somebody else has probably done it. It's well, it's all done at one point or another, times. right? But how did you get the belief that E equals mc squared? Or how did you? I mean, think of any famous equation. How did you get that belief? You didn't derive the equation, right? There's nobody in this room that could do that. No, right? It's, it's a simile, right? But that's okay. It's okay to. To, to, I mean, when you sit in a classroom and you listen to a teacher and you go, oh, that's interesting. When you read a book, I mean, you, there's nothing wrong with a healthy giving an authority, a healthy position. You don't do it unquestioningly, right? That's when it's irresponsible. You don't, it's not like you don't become a, a devotee of the person who just believe everything they say. You, that's why you need a committee, Right? Because you have authorities, they say stuff, and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go, let's derive that equation, right? Let's see if that really works, yeah. right? And then, do you right? think you can do the same thing with religion and your belief in God? Absolutely. Now, it's not an equation to be derived. But you can examine your belief, like maybe you got it through an experience. Maybe you got it from your an authority figure, but you go, no, wait a minute. Is this a reasonable belief? Are there any good reasons to all of this? Why do I believe this, right? I do this all the time, right? And then you can go, wow, okay, here's an argument that gives support for this belief. It's not a bad argument. It's pretty good, okay? So, okay, I got something, right? And here's another argument. Wait, there's a, here's an objection to that argument. That's not such a great one. What about this one, right? So you go through it, and you can go through and look at the arguments carefully. Now, I don't expect everybody to do that. Right. Um, I don't want to be an elitist when it comes to, you know, epistemic responsibility. But if you can do, if you can do that, then you probably should. Can you give me an example of a test you use? A test to test your belief in God. To test. So what do you mean by test? How are you going to know? Like science, you can do a test. You can find E equals M C squared. Right. Like you, you can examine the validity of your belief in a scientific principle. But how, how would you do that? in an equally accurate way for a religious belief. Okay. Or a specific religious belief. Or, yeah. Like God exists. How yes. about that? Or does prayer work? That's not testable. I could explain why. Um, why I don't think that's testable. Probably um, don't need to. Yeah. On the audience. In principle, yeah. It's, it's, it's silly to even do you right. experiment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other talk, right? You know, but, uh, um, but I mean, so here's the thing. Some people, if by test, I'm not sure if you mean, um, so give me an example of a scientific test that you would think of like a, an analogous to like what you're asking me for. Um, the well, acceleration of gravity is 9.8 sec meters per second squared, which I think we've probably all tested in the physics okay. at some point. Yeah, okay, so you have a little thing that launches a little ball, and you can, and you can do the measurements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you're testing whether or not the, the claim that that's the acceleration due to gravity is actually true. Okay, good. Now, so let's see. Um, okay, so 
I don't know. Do we have time for this? Because this yes. is yeah. taking so long. Okay. <laughs> we can be here until 8 o'clock. This is fun. Because, you know, this stuff is like, these are not easy questions, right? I can't just go, oh, blah, blah, blah. Right? Um, okay, so let's think of how this works. So you have a claim. Right? Um, and I'm not a good science person, I can't remember the, the symbols to use or whatever, but you know, 9.8 meters um, per second squared. Is that right? No, uh, in this case, like a slash. Yeah, slash. Right. Right. You know, acceleration. Mm -hmm. What's the symbol? Just little g. Little g, okay. I think that's great, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then, you, okay, so we figured that out. By empirical observation, and now I want to know is that true? And so I, I drop a ball, I, maybe I drop 10 balls, maybe I drop mine here, and I measure them, they all come out about 9.8, you know, accounting for error and so forth. So I think that confirms, right? So I can do experiments. This is subject to our own universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not the multiverse there. Thank you. I think that's a fair assumption, right? Okay. Experiments. <laughs> Yeah, confirmation, right? You get confirmation because the experiments give you the result you're looking for. Okay. So, um, what would be? Um, see, because. The thing about religious belief is, for the most part, it's not it's not in the realm of empirical science, mm -hmm. right? It's in the realm of philosophy, right? And if you count theology as part of philosophy, um, which is maybe I shouldn't, but theology and or philosophy, so it's in the realm of almost pure reason to some degree, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the religious claim, something like. God exists, <coughs> what sort of experiments could, is that the appropriate tool to use to confirm the truth of that claim? Because it's not an empirical claim, right? Depending on your concept of God, I'm going with sort of the standard Judeo concept of God, Judeo-Christian concept, which is that God is not a material object. Yes. Right? So, it's not an empirical claim. It's not the sort of thing that I, there's no test, there's no godoscope I could use to like, or, you know, that I could detect. And so, probably the analogous thing here would be, you know, you know, argumentation is using reason, mm -hmm. right? Here you're using empirical observation, scientific method, and, and reason, because that's part of that. But here it's almost, it's just pure reason. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the same thing can be said with mathematics. Now, like, yeah. you do proofs, like, you actually have to, like, reason out, like, why to do Yeah, but math, math and logic are the only two things we can do proofs in. It's the only two things in the world we can do proofs in. Mm -hmm. Everything else is, you can have evidence to support a conclusion, right? That you can have either more or less evidence and have either strong or weak argument for something. Well, even in mathematics, you can't prove things all the time. Like, right, but you, you have Pythagoras, Pythagoras' theorem, but that's never been proven to be a law. Right, but we, can, yeah, so far. but we can do proofs in mathematics. Right? Yes. But, Whereas in you know, other areas, there's nothing in philosophy that I can prove. There are no proofs, unless you get logic as a sub-discipline, right? I can do plenty of the logical proofs. But those are just proving laws of logic and so forth. I can't prove any by that, right? Any, I mean, I, if, as soon as you start introducing what the symbols represent, then all that's wrong, right? So can you show me an argument? For sure. That? Yeah, like, what, what is the argumentation there? Well, okay, so there are, you know, there's millions of them, right? So here's, here's a basic one, something like, um, I mean, some of you will recognize this, okay? Um, Thank you. 
This is sort of a preliminary argument, okay? Now, there are further steps I could I could move toward saying therefore God exists, right? But you see this is sort of a preliminary. This is a version of the cosmological argument. Some of you may recognize this exact version. Do yeah. you believe this to be true? Okay. Well, arguments cannot be true or false. Do you? Yeah. Do I think it's sound? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. I think it's sound. Could I be wrong? Do you I believe it's valid? Oh, absolutely, it's valid. I don't think anybody can be sound it has to be. What's that? Yeah. To be sound, it has no, to be. No, that. Mm -hmm. I got it. Yeah. So validity. You know, nobody really debates the validity of this. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. no, I take that back. There are other versions of the cosmological argument that people debate the validity, but this one is pretty inescapably valid. No, I got it. The question is: Is this true, and is that true? Right. That's the question. Is like, is this the case? Now, some people are. I would, might have to qualify like everything. Out above the quantum level. Yeah, like there's that. a lot of quantum stuff that is not like right. the design really better. But the thing is, that the quantum we don't know what the heck's going on most of the time there, right? So, um, but I could just say everything bigger, you know, everything above the quantum level or something like that, right? So this is an argument. Now, if I was relying on this alone, I'd be in trouble, right? But there are, I mean, over over centuries and centuries, people have produced dozens and dozens of these things. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not right? Some of them I find persuasive. Some of them I'm like, eh, it doesn't really work for me, right? Um, I'm not sure it's true or sound. Do you find cosmological arguments persuasive for your belief in them? Well, that's not or how I got my belief originally, yeah. right? This is sort of, this is part of my quest to be a responsible believer, mm -hmm. right? So as I come back, I pull that apple out of the barrel, I go, belief in God. Is this a good belief, right, or not? Well, why do I believe it? And then there's there's a whole host of these arguments that can support it, plus my own personal experience and lots of other things, right? Um, testimony from other people, right? None of those things in and of themselves, by themselves, are sufficient. But as sort of a collective effort, they can give enough support to warrant belief, in my, in my opinion, right, for me personally. And then that is going to be somewhat person-relative, like, how much evidence do you need to warrant belief, right? If you're being reasonable and you're being intellectually honest. Um, I mean, sometimes we just, you know, it's really hard to get past the, the non-cognitive factors sometimes. We don't, we don't want it to be true or we really want it to be true, right? Sometimes I, I think of it like this. If you had no stake whatsoever in the truth of the claim, Right? It, it had no bearing on your life whatsoever. You had no, no horse in the race. How would you think of that? Right? That's as objective, an imaginary objectiveness that we can, can get, right? Um, but the problem is because we do have a, a horse in the race, right? We have a lot at stake. What? So that, that, that affects our reasoning. Mm -hmm. so, and I know that, so I try to be careful. I try to be very careful. Yeah. So... So I can't do a, I can't do an empirical experiment on God. Yeah. And I'm not trying to dodge you. I really am not. No, you're fine. It's just a category issue, you know? It's the same thing with like, can I prove that, you know, there's no largest prime number? I can't do an empirical experiment for that either. Right? What do you think God's role is? His role? What What's his purpose? His Does purpose? he have a role? Man. I guess like why God? Yeah, That's like like yeah. I, or are you a deist or like a? Oh, I'm a theist. I'm I'm a mm -hmm. I'm a flat out crazy theist. Yeah, I'm all the way. So like so like, like why do? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, like, like why do I believe? Is that or you mean like what's his role in my life or what's like? Yes. Yeah, whatever you want to say. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm fairly open-ended. Yeah, here, interpret my question. <laughs> well, um, I I believe first and foremost because I had an experience of God that I can't. It would be irrational and unreasonable for me to deny it. 
Mm, that would be unreasonable, right? Now, I, I've had atheist friends who've said to me, "Well, I've never had that experience," and that's 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 just kind of how it rolls sometimes. Some people have these experiences, some people don't. Um, but that alone by itself wouldn't be enough to get me through all the way, I think, because you can question the reliability of your experiences, right? That's why you need a committee and not just one thing doing all the work. So, so that's why logic and reason, philosophy come into play. That's why testimony of other people, even authority can come into play in a healthy way, right? Um, because there are a lot of people a lot smarter than me that I trust that I listen to, you know, um, not all, and a lot of them disagree with me, you know, but I, I listen to people that are smart and have good things to say. So, but why do I believe, I mean, what's the purpose of it? What's the role of it? Um, there's a clever line by C.S. Lewis that I think actually says something good here, and I, I, think, I, I think I agree with it for the most part, but he said, he said, um, I believe in God. Uh, that's not such a great quote. I don't think about it. It's, it's a funny quote. I'll give it to you, and then you can see the problems with it. But he says, I believe in God for the same reason I believe in the sun. Like the, the big yellow ball. Not because, not, not nearly because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. So actually, that's not so bad. I was thinking at first he'd say, I don't believe in it because I see it. And of course, that's silly. But, but it's not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And I'd say that God plays that kind of role in my life as well. I feel like belief in God helps make sense of so many things in the world. It illuminates um, life um, and helps explain a lot of things to make sense. Does it explain everything? No way. Does it have some serious lacuna of explanation? Yes. Right? The problem with evil, right? <laughs> Big problem. Yeah. Do you think that religion and science have to contradict each other? Absolutely sometimes? not. Absolutely not. I don't think there's any contradiction between good science and good religion. Any, I don't think there's any contradiction whatsoever. But that's that's not a, that's not the standard view, right? So I have a question going back to two things you said during your presentation. Yeah. Uh, number one, when you were making the model, yeah. you said something like, you can question the model, it's not from heaven, it's not the Bible. Right. Do you actually think that, that we that the Bible are, should be questioned, or was that just being like sarcastic? Or? I'm being sarcastic. Okay. Which uh, isn't as funny to you guys, because you would, you would do the opposite of that anyway, right? But, but I say that to Christians sometimes. I have to say, this is not from, this is not, you know, I didn't get this from the Bible. Yeah, and other, like I say things... I mean, for the most part, for Christians, right, the Bible is a source of authority. And so, it's one thing to question my philosophical argument. It's another thing to say, well, that thing in the Bible is not true. That's like, ooh, ooh, careful, right? So if I say something like, just because I'm a Christian guy up here talking to, in a Christian audience, you don't have to believe everything I'm saying. And of course, that is even more so the case for you guys, right? Um, I mean, when you're in your classes at Mizzou, just because your professor says something and puts a model up on the board, doesn't mean it's true. Right? I mean, they're just guessing the most stuff anyway. And then one other thing you said is you said that when you were an atheist, you thought that you were more intelligent, more reasonable. Yeah. Um, and then you said that maybe a lot of people in this room might have the same beliefs. Uh, well, just, and you might actually be more intelligent. Just, just a quick poll. Does anybody think they're more intelligent because they're an atheist? Well, no. It's not that you think it's because you're an atheist, but you might think you're more intelligent than other people in general. Like, just in general. That I, bet, I bet, I bet if I interviewed you each individually, you probably think you're more above average intelligence. So why did you bring okay. it up in relation to your non-belief? Because I personally was being irresponsible, right? I, it was sort of hubris, right? And I was, I, I'm thinking, I mean, this is, I, I became a Christian when I was 21, right? So that's a great time for hubris. So. I thought if, it's true, if it was true for me, it could be true for all of you. So I mean, I I say this to anybody. It's, it's just a good thing to think about and be aware and not. So you don't want to get blindsided. If it's that. an idea not related to belief, if you were in a Christian audience, would you have said something like, "I'm sure many of you think you're more intelligent than everybody else"? Oh, would you, you have took that. You took offense to that. Yeah, what yeah I, just because that's kind of a common stereotype that atheists think that they're smarter, that they have it all figured out. I think if you went back and looked at the tape, I think what I actually said is. Probably most of you actually are more intelligent and more reasonable. That's not. Than I was. That's not. Yeah. So we could look at the tape, but I definitely was not. I did not mean to communicate the other thing. 
I said it about myself, because it was true about me. I had a kind of a hubris. And I said, I said, you guys probably actually are more intelligent and more reasonable. But. It reminded me of, like, uh, I was taking a psychology class this semester, and we learned about biases. Yeah. And there's that's, like, a specific established bias. Yeah. Like, everyone believes they're above average. Yeah. For, yeah. for the most part. Yeah, it is. It's just part of your, it's kind of hardwired yeah. into you. Um, anyway, yeah, that's how, how yeah. I took that. But. Read Kahneman, you know, he says, of course. But, um, yeah, so I did not mean to imply that, so I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that. I actually, I actually kind of, this group, I kind of admire this group. You know, I think of you guys, I do, I, my general impression is that you're probably smarter than average and more reasonable than most people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't mean to get too personal. Or sure. Try. You might have answered this before, anyways, but what exactly was it that made you change your mind? Well, you're not going to like this. So, um, because it, it, it was not, you know, intellectual argumentation. You know, as much as I'd like to say, yes, I examined all the arguments very carefully, and then I decided this was the most rational thing to do. It wasn't like that at all. I mean, I, I, um, I kind of fought, I, I went in kicking and screaming, you know. I mean, um, I was arguing right up to the bitter end. But I, I think um, some things began to sort of soften me a little bit. So I was a music major as an undergrad, um, and so music, I mean, I, music was kind of, can have a subtle way of, of getting a message in. There was some music I listened to that had a sort of this religious message in it, but I didn't know it. I don't know, I think subconsciously it kind of maybe softened me a little bit. I don't know, like that might have been part of it, but then I went, to, yeah, the lyrics. Yeah, yeah, the lyrics. Okay. No, no, just checking. I not the chords. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, you know, so I think that might, because I, I can remember too, like, going, what is that talking about? It's a, it's a band you've know, probably never heard of, but it, it's an acapella group called Take Six. Anyone ever heard of them? Probably not. They're totally, I don't even know who they are anymore. But they were like a jazz acapella group, and, you know. And everybody, like, all my friends who are music majors are like, oh, these are so cool. Everybody listened to them. But they were like a Christian group. I didn't even know. So I'm listening to this stuff. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? You know, because I didn't go to church. I never went to church growing up ever. Um, and uh, I mean, my church was like, I was raised in like the church of, you know, um, how would I put it? Uh, Hunter S. Thompson. You know, I mean, I was that was. <laughs> you guys don't even know Hunter S. Thompson. Don't even mind stuff my dad was into. You know. My, my, the church, you know, music was Pink Floyd, and, you know, the high priest was Douglas Adams, you know, so, um, yeah, so I, and I, so this stuff was all new to me, and then, and I went to this, I went to this meeting, there was like a concert, right, and there was this Christian music group, it wasn't really a band, you know, and they were playing this music, you know, I was there with my friend, and, um, and there was a girl I liked who was supposed to be there, so, yeah, so, uh, so I got there by hook or by crook, you know, and I got there and I was like listening to these people. The songs were pretty good, you know, but in between the songs, people were talking about how God has changed their life and all that. I just never heard anything like that before. I was like, wow, that's, that's different. And they were just painting this picture that it was totally different from what I'd always thought. I just had this very different sort of idea of what religion was and what God was like. And so I was like, oh, this is... This is interesting, and then at the end of the concert, you know, um, I I just had this I kind of had this experience where I just felt like, um, honestly, what it was like was I felt like there was this this wall around me that I built, and that something just went smash, and I was just there like naked and totally exposed, and I was like. God is real. Um, this is real. Oh my gosh. And God is way better than I thought. He's not at all like what I thought God would be. This is this is what I've always wanted. You know? Um, yeah, and I just I just knew it at that moment. So now, you know, I, I don't have epileptic, epileptic seizures. I'm not prone to, you know, hallucinations or anything like that. I mean, Maybe there's some sort of naturalistic explanation for what took place there. I don't know. But the most rational thing for me... I mean, if you ever saw the movie Contact, 
Anybody ever see that movie with Jodie Foster? And uh, what's his name? I've read the book. So. Yeah, I mean, she had no empirical evidence whatsoever for this claim that she's making. She's like, and they're like, well, why are you pushing this? Why are you still believing? She's like, because I had this experience and I can't deny it. It's as real as anything I know, you know. And that's so that's kind of how it started for me, you know. Yeah. So was it the lyrics that then drew you to the Christian God specifically? Or was it that you became a deist and then... No, no, it was, it was the Christian God, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was no stepping stone. I didn't even know what, I, you know, I don't think I even knew what deism was at the time. But, you know. Yeah. So then when I asked you what God's role was, yeah. if you believe in the Christian God, yeah. you have a specific answer then, don't you? Oh, well, I thought you kind of meant to me personally, like... If I just gave you some, how do I feel about, or are you talking about like salvation and all that kind of stuff? Sure, yeah. I mean, you have, if you But that's not in, why I believe. I'm if not, you, yeah, but you can, you have a belief in what God is. Sure. So then what is he? Like what's, it, um, is he the arbiter of heaven and does he um, micromanage everything? Stuff like that. Mm. You put it in such a negative. I don't think he micro. If you say it like that, of course I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> <say> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Framing. I, I will say this. You know, I, I'm I'm okay. You know, I've I've done enough studying to, to earn my PhD in philosophy, but I'm okay with not understanding everything. Right. I'm I'm okay with that. You know, I don't think that's a that's not irresponsible. I think it's actually very human and very. Responsible to say about some things, I just don't know. I don't understand how that works. Right? There's tons of stuff just in philosophy I don't understand, right? Kant, right? So, um, so yeah. So I mean, you could ask me lots of stuff. Well, how does this work? And how, I don't know. I mean, what I know is like, I mean, there's that old story in the, in the Bible, right, where the blind guy, Jesus heals the blind guy, and everybody's questioning him, like, well, what did he do? What? Well, I was, and they're questioning his theology to make sure he's. Because they won't, they don't like Jesus, right? And they're all they're all against him, and they're question. He's like, and the blind guy's just like, hey, listen, I don't know who the heck this guy was. All I know is I was blind, and now I can see. I think that like the concept of not knowing and being okay with it is it, it's very important to me. And through you know what I've heard from most of the people in this room, it's very important to them as well. And what the dissonance between that for me and religion is, is with religion you say, I don't know, but I'm still going to believe it, or I don't know, but I do know, hmm. it kind of reversal of it, hmm. um, that I, it doesn't really resonate with me yeah. at all. Yeah, well I think that's probably the, the correct stance for you, right? I mean, if you don't know, then you don't know, and that's where you should be. You know, I mean, I, I'm all for... Being intellectually honest, right? I mean, there's no reason to. Yeah, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. And if you know a little bit, then you can say, "Well, I know a little bit, and the rest I don't know." Or, or, or maybe you feel very confident that there's no God, right? There's probably some of you that feel like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident," you know. And, and I've looked at it carefully. And I've been very as objective as I can with all my biases, and this is just how it seems to me, right? I mean, this looks yellow to me. Some of you might say, no, that's banana or whatever. <laughs> right? But, but if, if it looks yellow, then you just got to say it looks yellow, right? I mean, if that's how things seem to you, then that's that's the right place to be. So, you know, so I, yeah, I mean, I think it's just you want to you wanna do the do the hard work as an adult of making sure you're, you're, you're doing what you need to do to be responsible with that, you know. Yeah. Are you finished with your thought? Yeah. Okay. If everything that begins exists because of, has a cause, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read through you, yeah. has a cause, <laughs> sure. and God uh, exists, or be, God began to exist, what is his cause? Yeah, so that's a good question. So on the standard. And this can be to you or whichever way is easiest for you to as answer. A, as a philosophy professor, yeah. So, um, on the standard Judeo-Christian view of God, right? So you might think it's a little unfair. We just kind of get to define God however we want or something like that. But, you know, there is a pretty standard definition, and then we're kind of stuck with that. 
to go fiddling with it would be ad hoc, right? So you don't want to fiddle with it too much. But on the standard view, God is eternal, right? He has no beginning. That's why premise one doesn't apply, because he's not a thing that began to exist. He has no beginning. Because if he did, then he would have to have a cause, right? This is Dawkins. He, he, put, he pushes this kind of argument, right? So, so yeah, but on the standard definition, right, which I'm, I'm willing to go by and have to stick with that has problems. God is eternal, you know, in both directions, and so there's no beginning. Infinity plus one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would I not be as equally set in saying that the universe is eternal? Has been eternal? Well, so that's, that's, a lot of people push that and say premise two is false. The universe has no beginning. Right? And there are some scientists who would endorse that view. It's a, it's a minority view, but it is a view. Right? And you can certainly push that. You just have to be able to say, okay, well, here's, here's, let me find the scientists who support that view and know why I hold that. And you, you wouldn't want to hold it just because it gets you the right, you know, gets you the right conclusion. Um, you wouldn't want to hold it just like I, I wouldn't want to hold this view just because it's very convenient and giving me a premise for my argument, right? We want um, conclusions that support yeah, well, one, the One big problem of that is the universe is in the realm of science where we've said God isn't. Yeah. And so all of the claims we make about the universe we can, to some extent, test. Yeah, so, so that's a really good point. So actually, you know, this argument, this is not a pure a priori argument. It's actually, a, it includes empirical claims, technically, right? So um, an a priori argument would be like the ontological argument, if you've ever heard that one. It's like, God is the greatest imaginable being, that sort of thing. I won't go into it because I don't think it's a great argument. Or you could talk about um, the moral the argument, right? The argument from objective morality or something like that. That would be more a priori, good reason. Doesn't work, there's no way to test empirically, but this is an empirical claim, right? So this claim's going to stand or fall based on, I'd say based on, I mean, there could be, there are philosophical arguments for this, and prior to 500 years ago, that's all there was for it, right? Or really prior to Hubble, really. I mean, nobody really had more than philosophical arguments for it. So this could be a pure philosophy argument, but I actually, I would draw science out to support number two as well. So, yeah. This is more on epistemology and going back to your model of yeah. variety of inputs. Do yeah. you think we can ever, so this isn't a question about the standard itself, but do you think that we can ever come to a standard of how much evidence or how much of these other inputs are required to form a justified or responsible belief? Such a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Right. I think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. And nobody has an answer to that question. Um, I mean, we have some rough guidelines. It's kind of like baldness, right? Right. I don't know exactly how many hairs it takes, but I know a bald guy when I see one, right? <laughs> and, and I know you're not bald, right? You got hair. But someone. Because there's some there's some vagueness problems maybe there, but it is it is really hard to say. Well, how much evidence do you need, you know, to be justified? Um, it's it's a hard one. You know, what counts as evidence? Difficult question. I mean, I think we have some rough ideas, and this is a place where intuitions actually can serve us. Philosophers, believe it or not, rely a lot on intuition. And if you're a scientist, you're thinking well, that's why I hate philosophy. Um, but it's not always bad, a bad thing, right? So there are just sometimes some general, we have a general feel for, if you tell me you believe X and you give me some reasons, and, I, and like I've got one reason for like believing X, you know, it's like the movie Back to the Future, right? So, you know, the, you guys, have you seen it? It's, you know, he's coming tomorrow. tomorrow. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the doc falls on the off the toilet, hits his head, he comes up with the, the design for the flux capacitor, that's horrible, right? That's irresponsible believing right there. That's, you know, he gets a tr maybe it's a true belief, but he has no real rational basis for beliefs. It's, I had a brain injury. That's why I believe this. That's terrible. Yeah. But it worked. But it worked. But, but you want more than now. Probably later he figured out why it worked. Right? And to be able to build it, you know. But, but, it, but in any case, if that was your only reason for believing that, I'd say, that's not enough evidence, right? That's not, you're not, you need to go back and do the work of research and figure out, you know, and ultimately, that's the thing, same thing with the contact, your contact. Um, 
on the girl that that she saw you. Yeah, well, but she had, she wasn't just hit on the head. Well, people, just... people might have said, oh, maybe she got hit on the head, she had an hallucination. But from her point of view, it seemed like a perfectly, she was perfectly coherent. She was, everything seemed as real as this room, right? I mean, you might be dreaming right now, right? This is philosophers love to pull this stuff. So you, you could, it's possible, right? You have to admit, it's in the realm of possibility that you're dreaming right now. And none of this exists, right? You're not in a room sitting in a chair. None of this is real. Um, but is that the most reasonable thing to think in your case? No. Probably not, right? It's far more reasonable to think this is really happening, right? So that's kind of how you do experiences. If I get hit on the head and I have a brain injury, and as a result of the brain injury, I come to believe that X, I ought to have some doubts about X, right? <laughs> that would be a reasonable thing to think, like, no, I'm not, I'm not, you guys want to defend, you know, the Back to the Future doc. I, I'm not down on him or anything. So, you know, he, what he probably did then was go back and see if it really worked and test his belief, and that's being responsible. Yeah. But, but, it, but it's when you have ex, a certain kind of experience that's not due to brain injury. It's experiences that happen kind of in the normal way. Yeah. Those are usually reliable, right? Unless you have some reason to think they're not. Like... A lot of the times, if they're never taken to a conclusion to show proof, then we just consider them psychotic. Is the problem. Like, like, give me an example. Well, if she insisted she saw aliens, and then it never came to be true, then people just say, well, she's some quack. Yeah, because of the kind of claim she was making, yeah, people are... They, and it's reasonable for them, right? In general, it's probably reasonable for them to, to think that she's probably deluded, right? Which is, because she's, especially because she's the only one. Now, if millions of people have that experience, and they all said something very similar, roughly, it gains plausibility. Unless you can explain it, why those millions of people all have the same kind of experience. Like, they all took a drug together or something, or they all have a similar brain malformity or something like that, right? So, because I, I don't know if you see, I see where you're pushing, you see where I'm pushing, right? So we're, you know, okay. Yeah, so. I'm just listening. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, my response to the millions of people kind of thing would be like, millions of people collectively have, you know, other beliefs as well. All kinds of other gods. gods. Yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, well, I mean. I, I, don't, I don't really think it lends any value to it for me personally. The number of people. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. that. Just strictly the number of people believing X doesn't necessarily um, support X. It's the argument would have to be a little more complicated than that, right? Um, but from a theism's point of view, even though there are different theisms, right? There are many theisms. If if you say basically, but theism, bare theism, just the belief in a supernatural being of some sort. That is awfully common, right? So, yeah, there could be different conclusions you could draw from that. You'd say, oh, it's just evolution's hardwired us to produce that belief, and we can probably explain that in some kind of adaptive advantage, maybe, right? That's one way you could explain that, but there could be other ways, too. So, it's not a, it's not a great argument, but um, it's something interesting, though, mm -hmm. right? Right? They don't all agree on what the God is like, they don't all agree on what we ought to do about it, but there's just an unbelievable amount of belief over the course of history. But I, I would say if you didn't count that as like, if, the, if that didn't really push you to weigh in one way or the other, I'd say you're probably fine, reasonably, to discount that, I guess. You know? But you'd have to know why that doesn't count. I guess you'd have to have a good reason for why that doesn't count. But it's not, it's, that's not why I believe, you know, it wasn't like, yeah. well, everybody else does. You know. so. Well, this was really fun. Yeah, thank you so um, much for this. Yeah, I totally um, enjoyed it.